Thank you, Brother Terry. <clears throat> thank you both of you, brethren, for your prayers, and thank you for your zeal of singing the sweet praises of our Lord and our God. This morning, if the Lord be pleased, I'd like to speak to you on a passage of Scripture that is often misapplied. Not that I know everything. I do have a pretty simple mind, and sometimes my simple mind is what keeps me on the right track. And I'll tell you why. Because when I read a passage of Scripture, I have to go into that Scripture and find out the message that's taught in that chapter. Anytime you read a passage of Scripture, you must be careful and not pass summary judgment on that passage. You must study it within the context with which it's taught. Okay? The passage is found in Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. I'd like to read first in verse number 16. Anytime you see the phrase, Thus saith the Lord, anytime anything is read out of the Bible, you need to set up and take notice. But when you see the phrase, Thus saith the Lord, you need to take special notice. And find how the scripture in that passage applies to us. So let's read this passage. This is Jeremiah chapter 6, and verse number 16. Jeremiah reports from the Lord. He says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. That passage has been used over the years among the primitive Baptists, oftentimes to, to encourage churches to cling to traditions that were developed after biblical times. I could run through a list of those for you, but I don't want to waste time doing that because we're already 20 minutes into the preaching service. This passage, when it speaks of the old paths, you're holding them in your hand. You're, it's speaking of the Word of God, not what some man determined, what some ecclesiastical body determined, but the old paths is in reference to the Word of God. Okay? So let's deal with that. So let's look at it in its particular context. Each time you read a passage of Scripture, you must evaluate within the context. That's the reason Paul told Timothy, to, told the preachers, uh, after him to study, to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. A minister that doesn't do that, he will make a fool of himself when he gets up to speak. So he says, study. So first thing I wanted to do is look at it in its context and then see if it did have application beyond this chapter. And it does, and I'll show you. Let's go back to the first part of that chapter and get the context of what's being considered here. Remember Jeremiah... Jeremiah was the prophet on scene that prophesied uh, during the end of the period of the kings and the opening of the period in which the children of Israel, uh, Judah, Jerusalem, were taken into captivity in Babylon. He warned kings, at least three kings before it happened, he warned them of what was about to happen. He warned Judah, he warned Jerusalem, and all the cities round about. Told them exactly what was going to happen. God gave him that message and he delivered that message. One time he was thrown into prison for delivering that message. They threw him into the pit, as a matter of fact. And then uh, later on, the, uh, after he was released, the king sent for him again. They wanted, wanted to talk to him. And Jeremiah said, oh, I'm not going. You'll just throw me in the pit again. And because I'll, I'm just going to tell you the same truth that I told you before. So the point is, Jeremiah was preaching and teaching the truth of God to a people when many of them did not want to hear it. So watch what happens. Beginning in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, he says, O ye children of, Ju uh, of Benjamin, the smallest tribe of Israel. Uh, at that time, in the, in the nation of Judah, there was only two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. He says, Gather yourselves uh, uh, to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem. So he's telling them, we're not going to read every word of this, but you can read it for yourselves. He's telling them that the, the destroyer is coming. He says, Get together, get ready to flee, because the destroyer is coming coming. Then if you move down to verse number 6, something that some people just simply will not have. Watch this. 
For this hath the Lord of hosts said. Now he's speaking now to the destroyers that's going to come to Jerusalem. For thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees, and cast a mount against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. So God not only called the destroyer into Judah and Jerusalem, but he directed their attack. Now why would he do that? He did that because if you read the last chapter of 2 Chronicles, the last chapter of 2 Kings, they were warned. Prophet after prophet was sent to the children of Israel of Judah, sent to them warning them of their ungodly behavior. They had left off serving God and went to serving idols and themselves. So the Lord sent prophet after prophet. They mistreated those prophets and even got to the point that they killed them. And finally God said, an end. That's it. Then he called the destroyer to come in, and then he told the destroyer, Nebuchadnezzar in particular, exactly how he wanted him to attack Jerusalem. So let me ask you this question. Would God do that? Yes, he would, and he did that. And that's not the only time that he did that either. Because his people had turned away from him to idols. Then, in verse number 8, Judah is warned to obey Jerusalem. He says, be thou instructed, O Jerusalem. He says, don't you hear what's happening? Don't you hear what's about to happen to you? Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. So, God delivered a message to, Jeru uh, uh, to um, Jeremiah. He says, go tell them. Listen to me. I want you to listen to me. I want you to hear what's about to happen to you, and so listen and learn and turn from your wicked ways. Well, verse number 11. When Jeremiah received that message, go to, to, just tell them what's going to happen. Jeremiah said in verse number 10, To whom shall I speak? And give warning that they may hear. Behold, their ears are uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. So Jeremiah says... Back to the Lord, he says, you know, who am I going to tell? They don't listen. They haven't listened yet. And what makes me think they're going to listen anyway? But God says, you go deliver that message anyway. They haven't been listening. What makes you think they're going to listen now? I'm amazed at how God would let such men as Jeremiah talk to him. But our God is a gracious and a merciful God. Look at verse number 11. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. Men, that God's fury is about to come on this scene and destroy that whole city and the cities round about it. Look at verse number 14. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. You know what that means? It means they were slothful and half-hearted. They just had a show of religion. They had just checked the box and say, I've served God. Well, verse number 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No. Was there any shame found in them? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. So let me ask the question again. Would God do that? Now, I was preaching on a similar subject one time several years ago in a place that a preacher came to me and and he said, you do know that he was talking to Israel and not to the world at large. I said, yes. He was talking to his people. So my response about that, I said, how many of his people do you suppose live in the United States of America? According to the latest statistics that I read, 70% of the people in this country believe in God. They profess to believe in God. Guess who he's writing this to? To them. This is a message to the children of God, the born of the Spirit of God, those who can hear. But they don't hear because, you know why? We've had it so good for so long, and they, they're more interested in the carnal and the natural things of this world than they are in godless service. Now keep that in mind. That is when he said, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest uh, for your souls. But they said, We will not walk. We'll stop there. Because we've already got more before us than we'll have time to address this morning. Now, when he said, when he said, stand in the ways. The word stand means take a position. It's hard, the, the, the image here is somebody that's lost their way. 
When you lose your way, if you just keep going, you're probably going to go in the wrong direction. So the image is stop for a moment. Just stop. I remember one time when I was in Germany, I was on a business trip traveling across the back trunk trying to save some time. Got off the autobahn and going to travel across the country. And I got so lost that I couldn't even read the map. I mean, I was totally lost and got into one of those little uh, uh, villages. And there was roads going up everywhere. I couldn't read the road signs, couldn't find the road signs on the map. I mean, I was totally lost. Do you know what I did? I pulled off on the side of the road. And I looked lost. <laughs> you, know, you know, you can you can look lost. I looked lost, and this German business fellow came up to me, could speak a word of English, not a word, word, and I could probably speak a half a dozen German words at that time. And uh, he could, he could tell I was lost, and so <clears throat> I could tell he was trying to ask me. I have my map out there on the hood of the car. I could tell he was trying to find out oh, well, where are you going. So I got the name of the town out where I was going, which was actually up in Holland, and he laughed, because I was way off course, way off course, and he laughed, and when he finished laughing, he, he, um, he pointed down to the map, and uh, then found it, pointed to him and me and said, this is where you are right here, and said, this is where you are, this is where we are right now, and then he began to show me on the map how to get away from where we were uh, to where I was going in Holland. And so that, that, that word stand in the way, that means exactly that. Stop where you are, examine where you are. And by the way, we have the perfect map interpreter, the Spirit of God. We take the map out. When you stop and you begin to look, he will tell you where you are and the right path. You know, David said that in, in Psalm 119. He says, thy word is a lamp uh, unto my feet. You know what that means? You apply the Word of God, the Word, the lamp unto your feet, you can tell exactly where you are in the life of your service to God. And it's a light unto my path, and it will show you where God intends for you to go. How about that? That's good, isn't it, to know that God has given us uh, the Word, He's given us the map, and He's given us the light to illuminate so that we understand where we are and where He would have us to go. And to see, He says, take, uh, take a moment and stop and examine where you are and see uh, what the will of God is for your life. And, you know, I've had people many times tell me, well, I don't know what God's will for me is. My response usually is very kind, and I try to be very gracious and patient. My response usually is, you're not listening. That's usually the case. You're not listening. You're so full of yourself. And I usually, I'm not just crass. I'm really not when I talk to someone. Uh, but usually I, I try to communicate to them uh, that you're so full of yourself, so full of your trouble, you're so uh, blinded by the issues and trials of your life that you cannot see the Word of God as it applies to your life. So it's necessary to stand still for a moment. Be still and know that I am God, God says. And then he says, ask for the old paths. The old paths. The old paths are the old paths that's recorded in the Word of God. That's exactly what he's talking about. It's the way uh, that God has prescribed for, the, uh, for his church to worship, what we're supposed to believe in, how we're to behave in this life, our worship. You know, God is God. Amen? I think that goes to that saying, God is God, right? He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He has all power. Uh, he is God. And so the church is his bride, right? Amen? It's his bride. It's a place where he meets us to worship. So does this stand to reason that he has the right and the authority to dictate to us how we worship, right? And by the way, the scripture tells us that we belong to him and we're not our own. So when you say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what you're saying? I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saying, I believe in the one that, has, that owns me. You know how he owns you? First of all, God the Father gave you to him before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 and 4. Not only that, he bought you with the price of his blood. We belong to him. We're obligated uh, to him as our Lord, the one who owns us. We're obligated to obey his word. Jesus Christ said on the night before he was crucified, if you love me, keep my commandments. That is, demonstrate to me that you love me, keeping whose commandments, by the way? My commandments, His commandments, His word, He has authority over us. Now, you, know, I want, you ought to hear a preacher and listen to him when he's preaching what? The word. Uh, to preach the word. We ought to listen carefully. We ought to compare what we hear to what the word of God says. We ought to pray for the preacher that he'll preach the word. Paul told Timothy to preach the word, not philosophy, so not some man's ideas. Uh, so what has been commonly accepted as Christian uh, theology, he says you preach the word. And by the way, that is the old path, and God has changed the path. 
And as a matter of fact, the word old has a connotation of everlasting. Go look it up. The word that's printed old in your Bible comes from a Hebrew word that means that has a secondary meaning that means everlasting. And so the old path is the path that's everlasting. It will still be the true and valid word of God when Jesus Christ appears in the eastern sky and says, Come, you blessed of my Father, and here the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. It will still be valid then. All right? Then he says, he refers to it as the good way. Why is it good? The first good thing that we need to consider about that is God is God, and, our, and the whole duty of man is fear God and do what? Keep his commandments. It is good because by obeying him, we worship him in spirit and in what? Truth. All right? That's what's good about it. All right, that's one thing that's good about it. Another thing that's good about it is that it feeds our soul. Let me give you an illustration of the man that came to Jesus Christ, the publican. That, uh, uh, that came to Jesus Christ. He was a man that was a sinner. He stood all afar from Jesus Christ. He couldn't even approach him, couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he smote himself upon the breast and said, Lord, have mercy upon me, or what? Sinner. My friends, Jesus Christ said, that man went down to his house righteous. You know why he went down to his house righteous? Because Jesus Christ shed his blood for him. There was a man who died a good death. The man who hung on the cross with him. And on the right hand of the cross of Jesus Christ, um, early in the day, both of those things have been raving upon Jesus Christ. Something happened to this man. Uh, the Spirit entered his heart and his mind sometime during the course of that day. And so then he turned to Jesus Christ. And he said to his Lord and his Master, his Savior, uh, the one he loved but above all, he turned to him and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Uh, the Lamb of God did not turn to him and say, you sorry, Master, you sinned, you were a thief, or whatever you were, you're on here just to just die in your shame. You know, he'd have been just if he'd said that. But he came to save sinners from what? Their sins. So he turned to that man. He said, today, that is, before the sun goes down today, thou shalt be with me where? In paradise. That's my God. Was that a good message for that man? Uh, not another word is heard in Scripture from that man. Don't you know that he died a good death? I say, come, look at death. Come, I'm ready to go with thee. I, I'm ready to depart this world and see my Lord. I want to be with him in paradise. I want to be gathered around that throne. I want to join those who are there now singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Amen. Is it good? It's the good path. Man. It's the good way, isn't it? Now, he goes on to say, and walk therein. That means live your life according to this way. You know, our life is not that long. It really isn't. I don't care if you are over 90 years old. This life is not that long. You know, I think about that often. Most mornings I get up and I think about that, just how insignificant I am. Next week I'll be 66 years old, and that don't even count. If you plot the algebraic line and put the infinity marks on both ends and put that dot in the center and you get out there somewhere and you put that little dot that represents 66 years of life, you couldn't even see it. It would be so insignificant that it would never appear. When I'm gone off the scene, uh, you know, and the next year I might be a faint flicker in somebody's memory. And I would be just. Let me tell you something. What does matter is what we do in this short period that we're here. In this short period here, Jesus says, if you love me, he wasn't begging either, by the way. Jesus Christ never begged for anything. He says, if you love me, you show me by keeping my commandments. So he says, <clears throat> as you look for the old pious, and which is the good way, I want you to walk therein. Walk therein. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, as we move toward the New Testament, Matthew chapter 7, Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the, uh, is the Lord's opening message for his church kingdom. When he was said, he began to teach them about his church kingdom and their behavior. He gave them the Beatitudes first and then told them about various things that they had heard that wasn't so. And he began to teach him about behavior and the teachings and the practices of his church kingdom. Get down to verse number 7. An amazing thing, uh, in verse number 13, he talks about the straight gate. But in verse number 12, he talks about the golden rule. In verse number 15, he talks about the false prophets. He sort of wedged in there the message on the straight gate between the golden rule and the false prophets. 
Uh, that tells me that the Lord is telling us, get ready, life in my service is not going to be always easy. Now watch this. Verse number 12, he says, therefore, uh, all things whatsoever you, uh, you would do, uh, you would that men do should do uh, to you, uh, do you even so to them, for this is the law uh, and the promise. So that means, if you want you people to love you, you want people to treat you fairly, guess what you're to do to them? Are you to do the same to them? If you want people to be kind and gracious to you, be that way to them. If you want somebody to forgive you, we're to be ready to forgive others. You know that's really important? You know, one time the Lord was talking to his apostles about forgiving, and, um, and, the, uh, and, and Peter's bouncing back and said, well, you know, if my neighbor offended me, how many times am I going to forgive him? Seven times? Like, that's a lot? Seven times? You can almost see the Lord having a little smile on his face saying, no, seven times seventy. That means perpetual. If that man comes to you and says, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? You're obligated by the Word of God to do so. Somebody say something to offend you, do something against you, and ask you to forgive them, what are you to do? Forgive them. That is the Lord's way. How did he do that? You know, there's a woman that came to the Lord at night, uh, and had suffered a meal one night, came to him. She was a sinner woman of the city. And you know what the Lord did to her sins? He forgave her her sins right there in front of her accusers. How about that? That's an amazing thing, isn't it? That's the God that we have. Uh, the Apostle Paul viewed himself, instead of himself, oh, wretched man that I am. He said, I don't deserve to be an apostle. I don't deserve to be a child of God. I don't I desire uh, to be uh, a part of his church. I don't be a, desire to be a part of him. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. God has given me this position in him uh, because he's a gracious and a merciful, a loving and a long-suffering God. Now, I could spend all day uh, spouting off adjectives that des- and adverbs uh, that describe my Lord. How about that? You just can't say enough, can you? Well, after that, he says, well, let's go 15, then we'll come back to 13. He says, beware. Now, if this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, speaking, saying, beware, you know what you need to do? <laughs> you need to beware. I mean, if you're, if you're a law enforcement officer, and you're, uh, you have a... You, you have somebody in, in a building that's got a gun, and you've got to approach that building, and the, and the on-scene commander says, beware. You know what you need to do? You need to approach very, very carefully, right? right? Okay. So he says, beware of false prophets. You know what a false prophet is? A false prophet is a, fa- a prophet that ain't. He's just not a prophet. I mean, so well, whatever comes out of his mouth is not so. You know how you can tell the difference between a false prophet and a true prophet? Listen to what he says. If he preaches the word, then more than likely he is. If he don't preach the word, more than likely he's not. So he says, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They look nice, they sound nice, and at first they act nice. Uh, come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And what is a ravening wolf? What is his motive in life? To feed himself. To, uh, to take care of himself. Don't care about anything, anybody, anywhere. You're not too big. You're not too little. You're not too innocent. You're not too sweet. A raven and wolf will take you down. That's a cousin to a coyote. I, I just got to tell you this to emphasize the gravity of a raven and wolf, a false prophet. Years ago, I was selling insurance in Bay County. And I had a house that I was visiting up 77 out, way out in the, way out in the woods. And I turned down the road there. I would taken care of the business, and I was on the way out, looked up in the view mirror, and there was a coyote across the road right behind me. He had something in his mouth. I stopped and looked. That coyote had a little dog in his mouth. I thought to myself, that star rascal's not going to run for that little puppy. I got a little thing for puppies. I, I just, there's just something in my heart for little puppies. I said, that rascal's not going to get away from you with that puppy. And I had a, I had a pole about like that. About that big round behind my seat, I grabbed that pole and I stood up. And that rascal stopped. He was going to fight me for it. He stopped and looked at me. I mean, he had the meanest look you ever seen in your life. And I saw that little puppy, and that little puppy was already passed away. If that puppy still been alive, me and that coyote would have duped it out, and I believe I'd have won. But that just goes to show you, it doesn't make any difference how innocent. A person is, a church is, a lovely church, a raven wolf is going to feed himself because the only honor 
themselves, embroiled themselves. So he says, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now look at verse number 13. Go back with me now. So he says, enter ye in at the straight gate. Now notice, it's important to read the words. That word straight, how is it spelled? S-T-R-A-I-T. How often have you heard that um, uh, applied as straight as in a straight line? That word straight means with exceeding difficulty. As a matter of fact, mariners, a ship's captain and a pilot knows exactly what a straight is, do they not? They know what it is because that's a very narrow passage where there's boulders under the water and cliffs on the side, usually. It's a straight, it's a difficult way. So he says, he says, enter ye in. So he's telling us, enter ye in at the straight gate. That means the place where it's difficult. You know, I, one of the modern Christian philosophies is if you're following Jesus Christ, life is going to be a brilliant. Everything's going to be just fine. You won't have any trouble. Uh, if just, you know, I'm amazed at that teaching. I really am. You know why I'm amazed? I wonder if, if you sit down with the Apostle Paul and said, let me ask you about something. When you started following Jesus Christ, did your life get a whole lot easier? I was, mm, no, I, I don't think so. You know, I, I was beaten, I was stoned, and I was in prison, I was in perils of the water, in perils of the wilderness, in perils among my own brethren. What about Jesus Christ? He said, yo, see, now, when you um, began your public ministry, Jesus Christ was about 30 years old, did your life get easier? No, they were called. We trying to throw me out of the city. They wanted to stone me. You know, but they, they, they crucified me. What about James? What about James? You asked James. Well, you couldn't ask him because they killed him with a sword. The Christian people had to flee Jerusalem. When they got to other places, they had to flee there. Do you know the Christian people have been fleeing uh, ahead of uh, persecution ever since then? And for the last 400 years, we have had more peace and more liberty in this country than at any time in the history of man. Do you know that? We need to be thankful. So he says, enter ye in at the straight gate. Be ready to endure difficulties and trials. And so there's another question that I must ask associated with this. Is Jesus Christ worthy of us making the sacrifice to enter in at the straight gate? We need to ask ourselves that every day. The short answer is, you better believe it. He is worthy for me to make whatever sacrifice is ne as is necessary to serve him. So he says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way uh, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in that. Well, there's a bunch going in it today, I promise you, taking the easy way out. But my friends, the hard way is to serve God. My dad taught us boys. He says, boy, he must have told us this a million times. Boys, anything worth having is worth what? Working for. He said, if you don't work for it, it's not worth having. So he says, <clears throat> Enter ye not the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth in, uh, to destruction, and many there uh, be which go in there at the cause straight. They look for the easy way because straight is the gate and it's narrow the way. Narrow is the way which leadeth to life. He's not talking about eternal life. He's talking about a life in Jesus Christ. I want a life right now, do you not? I want to feel my God's presence with me right now. I want to feel Him in the morning. I want to feel Him all through the week. I want to feel Him when the storms come, when the trials come, when the disappointments come, the discouragements come, the heartbreaks. I want to feel my God's presence with me all the time. We do come to the point where we ask, like the prophet, oh, uh, and when he said, Art thy mercies clean gone forever? Have you left me here? Am I all alone? Don't you hear me anymore, Lord? Oh, he can come to the point where David was at in Psalm 51. He said, when he cried out to God, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. I'm to the point where I can't even feel thy salvation anymore. Can, we, can, a, can a child of God get in that state? The truth is, David was a child of God, born to the Spirit, but he disobeyed God. He took the wrong path. He took the wide gate and the broad way and didn't make the sacrifice that was necessary. And he brought shame and pain to himself and to his family for the rest of his life. Because straight is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Now, when Jeremiah... 
gives us the message from the Lord. He says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. Walk therein means, learn the word, walk and live according to the word of walk therein. Would you turn with me to Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, to begin with. Walk therein. Now, You've heard the term, our Christian walk. Our Christian walk. Paul has a lot to say about our Christian walk. So when we learn the old paths and we see them, you know, it's one thing to know something, it's quite another to do it, isn't it? It, it really is. I, I venture to say that you folks in law enforcement have seen a lot of folks come before the judge that knew the law, but they didn't keep it. And they paid a price. It's one thing to know it, and another thing to do it. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. <clears throat> and you, anytime you see the word in, guess what? There's something important that went before. We'll come back to that in a moment. You would just walk up to somebody and say, and? <laughs> yeah, you know, really, really think you lost your mind. You said, and? Well, and what? What and? So, but anyway, we'll come back to that in a moment. It says, and you had he quickened. Uh, who were dead in trespasses and sin. That means something good's been done to you. You now know me. I have brought you to the state that you now know me and you love me. You have been quickened and um, uh, you were once dead in trespasses and sin, but I've quickened you. Wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, he says, the spirit that thou worketh in the children of disobedience. He says, one time you walked like the world. And so Paul's exhortation, and we'll come back to it in a moment, his exhortation, don't return to that. Don't slip back. You know, I started out this past week studying about King Asa. Do you know he was a, he was a good king all the way up to the very end of his life? And he quit listening to God. He died in shame. He was a good king to the end of his life. And he quit listening to God. You know, that's the same thing happened to King Solomon. He was a good king. He wrote a big part, portion of the Old Testament. When he got to the end of his life, he quit listening to God. And went to serving the gods that his wives served. How about that? All right. Let's get before the word and for a moment. Let's get before that. The old past. What about the old doctrinal past? Let's just touch that real quick before we go. The old doctrinal past. Oh, right, so let me ask the, this question first. Does doctrine make a difference? Oh, yes, it does. Because the doctrine of Christ tells us who Christ is to us and who we are to Him and what His intentions are for us. How about that? So, who is Christ to us? Who is He to us? He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our Master. He's our hope of heaven, is he not? All right. Then who are we to him? To him we're his beloved, that he loves so much that he came to this world to give his life for and to save us from our sins. That's who we are to him. And one of these days, what's he going to do? He's going to come and get us and take us to be home, uh, to an eternal home with him. Now, doctrine makes a difference because it tells us these things. Paul says it brings life and immortality to light. To our understanding. Let's just touch it very briefly. In, um, in Ephesians 1 and 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Those who are blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places are those who are walking according to the old paths, wherein is the good way. I want to live in the good way. Do you not? Right now, it's easy to say that in, because if your mind is what my mind knows, and you can rejoice and say, I enjoy living in the good way. Not that I'm good by my nature, but I live in the good way, that is in the way of my God. So he says, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation, the doctrine of Jesus Christ says that he, that God the Father chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Is that what your Bible says this morning? Uh, so did he do that? That's the old past. That's the fundamental point of doctrine. Now let me tell you something. We are known as primitive Baptists. Before that, we were the old school Baptists. And we uh, uh, were, began to be known as primitive, meaning old and original. The old past, the old doctrine. Our ancestors assumed that name because they refused to compromise the doctrine of Christ. Now, 
So he chose us in, God the Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, now think about that for a moment. You're holy and without blame this morning in this context, not because anything you have done or what any other human being has done to you or for you. You're holy and without blame because Jesus Christ hung on the cross willingly, shed his blood, and gave his life on the cross, and declared to God the Father in John chapter 19, it is finished. I have made my children that you have given to me holy without blame. Now, I always like that word predestinated, don't you? You all like that word? Now just think about it. Do you like that word? You better like it. You better like it because it's a biblical word, and it tells what God has done for you. Watch this now. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. The old past doctrine says that God predestined. That means he's determined. When did he determine? Verse number four. Before the foundation of the world. That he would adopt us as his own. And here's the question I like to ask always about that. Why adoption? Why adoption? Because he has only one begotten son. All right, let's continue on down as we consider the old pious of the doctrine. I'm, I'm, my, the clock's running too fast. Why don't you, brother, take care of that for me, okay? Verse number seven, in whom we have redemption. This was 2,000 years ago. The old past doctrine says, in whom we have. What's the difference in have and will have or can have? When he says, in whom we have, that means something that you are in possession of this morning. And if God, this is, this is a commitment that is made by the God that cannot what? Lie. In whom we have redemption through what? Through his blood, it is through his blood, it is through his blood, and through his blood only. Not, you have no contribution to your eternal salvation. Jesus Christ declared on the cross, it is finished. That's the old pass. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. From an eternal perspective. When was your sin forgiven? On the cross. The word forgiven, I like to use Brother Jim when I come to this subject. If Brother Jim loaned me a thousand dollars and I was struggling to try to figure out how to pay for it and couldn't put together enough pennies to do it, and Brother Jim just put his arm around me and said, that's okay. I forgive you that debt. You don't owe it anymore. What he's saying is, the debt is paid. It's over. When Jesus Christ stood on the cross at his finish, he said, before God the Father, before all who heard that day, and before all the children of God who read this word, your sin debt's forgiven. It's already paid. Don't worry about it anymore. Do you know, did you know that there's not one single solitary place in the Bible where God the Father threatens his children with eternal destruction? He tells you that he'll chase you in this life. But he never threatens you with eternal destruction. You know why? Because Jesus Christ, his son. You know, that's one of the most abominable things in the Bible. Is the deformation of Jesus Christ. Did Jesus, what did he come in this world to do? The, the old paths of doctrine says that Jesus Christ came in this world to do something. The New Testament opens in Matthew chapter 1, verse number 21. The angel of Joseph said concerning, uh, concerning Jesus Christ, for he shall do what? Save his people from their sins. You know, our ancestors uh, were mocked a lot, called in hard shells. And so a lot of folks think it's because of the just the mis mispronunciation of the word shall, hard shall. So if God said he shall save his people from their sins, guess what? It's done. And Jesus Christ punctuated that when he said, it is finished. He has saved us from our sins. Thus, he had, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his what? The riches of his what? That old past doctrine tells that you are forgiven by grace. And what does grace mean? Grace means it's something that you couldn't possibly deserve, but it's given to you. Verse number 11, in whom we also have an inheritance. There it is. There's that word have again. Right there. In whom we have, not can have, should have, might have, but you have it. Right now, you have it. Remember what Jesus told his apostles on the night before he was crucified? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you in his going 
He prepared that place. Did he do that? Did he prepare a place for you this morning? So how many is going to be left behind? How many? Jesus Christ said in John chapter 6, of all the Father has given me, I've lost what? Nothing. I like that, don't you? I, I, I like a sure thing. The doctrine of Christ is sure. Now, let's go back to walking. Those who are under the comforting and joyful blanket of the old past doctrine of Christ are obligated to walk by that doctrine. So he says, now, you know, used to, you know, I did, I was born and raised in the swamp, so I can say used to. I can say that. Used to. You walked according to the course of this world. You behaved like everybody else. Maybe some of you didn't. I'd like to say I didn't. But walked according to the course of the world. According to the prince of the power of the That points to the devil himself. The devil likes it whenever you get off, the, off of this path and follow something other than the old path. So he said, you used to walk like that. Now come on down with me to verse number 8. The Apostle Paul introduces another point of doctrine here. The doctrine... The old, of the old pious. He says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. How about that? You're saved, and it's a gift. And then some offer to get off the old pious and say, Well, it's the gift that's offered. No, no. I wasn't even on this world when this gift was given and when it was finalized. This is an endowed gift. So he says, and It's not of works, believing it's of works. So he says, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, if we could, if we could accomplish our own salvation, we'd walk around beating ourselves on the chest and talk about how we saved ourselves. And where does that leave Jesus Christ? Well, I thought that I did that. I, really, I was really convinced that I did that. Let me tell you something. If you're saved to heaven this morning, Jesus Christ did it all by himself on the cross 2,000 years ago. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. He said we're, we're in him and our purpose in being in him is to do good works. It's a good way, isn't it? So we ought to be doing good works. Which God hath ordained before that we what? Should walk therein. We're obligated to our love to Jesus Christ. He said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments, all right? So let's move on a little further through this now. Well, as he's talking about uh, walking in the service or in the paths, the old paths. Well, go to chapter 4, verse number 1. Therefore, Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1. Therefore, the prince of the Lord, I therefore, the prince of the Lord, beseech you. This is, I strongly encourage and exhort you. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Walk worthy of the vocation, your service, your work. God has called you to work. That's the reason he's given us spiritual life. That's the reason he, he saved, uh, saved us from our sins. That we would walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. How do we do that? He explains. He says, just like this, this is how you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith, uh, wherewith you are called, with all lowliness. Now, what do you mean lowliness? In the house of God? There's no big eyes and little ears. Among the children of God, we ought to always be at one another's feet. Always. Not just at communion time, but always be at one another's feet. Be ready to serve one another with all lowliness and meekness. You know, a meek person behaves in such a way that you just don't have a problem walking up to them and talking. Have you ever, have you ever been around anybody that that you just felt obligated to go talk to him. <laughs> so I, I, I just don't know if I want to go up there and, and, and talk to that person. I, you know, they're just so brassy and, and so harsh in the matter. I, I think I'll just, I think I'll just, just pass. Have you ever met anybody like that? I, can, I have a bunch of them, matter of fact. He says, but you're not to be that way. You're to be lowly and meek. So meek that anybody, from the smallest little children child to the oldest person to the one in the lowest station to the one in the highest station and that little quiet person off in the corner that everybody would just feel so comfortable to come up and talk to you and say good morning and want to get close to you we're to behave in such a way that every child of God wants to be close to us 
with all lowliness. And that, this is the old past. He says, with all, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering. What if somebody says something that, or does something to offend us? The word long, that means a long time. Suffer for a long time. Don't, don't be quick to answer. You know, James has a lot to say about the little member of the tongue and what a great trouble it causes. He says, get control of it. You just, just be patient. You endure. Just swallow hard and just endure the things that are said. Long-suffering, forbearing. That means putting up with one another. I know that y'all love me because y'all put up with me. You have to. I, you know, I, it, it takes a lot of forbearing to deal with me. I know that. But you're so kind. And I, I'm so gracious, and I just love you dearly. Long suffer, forbearing one another in love. And by the way, that word love is the same word that's translated charity in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And right now, it had been my, my thought to go to chapter 13 to talk about charity again. It's already after 12 o'clock. Now, I'll tell you what I would like to do. I'd just like to go to chapter 5 and verse number 15 to summarize all of this. Paul says, Ephesians 5 and 15, he says, See then, after I said all these things and taught you all of these things, see then that you walk circumspectly. Circumspectly comes from a word that means accurately and diligently. That means walk according to the old paths accurately. And how are we going to do that? We're going to spend time studying the Word of God, learning the Word of God. We're going to avail ourselves of the preaching and the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and apply our lives. We're going to walk this way. You know, the Solomon said, Lord, what shall I render to my Lord? For all of his mercies shown. How can I better serve him today? Today is another day. So how can I do a better job serving my God today? And then and then he goes on and begins to teach us. This is, well, he said he already talked about how we ought to behave individually. He says, Wives, this is how you be a biblical wife. In verse number twenty two, husbands, verse number twenty five, this is how you be a biblical husband. In chapter six, verse number one, children, this is how you be children um, in the in the old past. Fathers, this is how you be a father. Servants, and those who are employees, this is how you be an employee in the old past. And verse number nine, he says, Masters or supervisors, this is how you be a supervisor in the old past. And he says, if it gets tough, then put on the whole armor of God. He says, you've got everything that you need to walk in the old past. And we get down to verse number 18. We bring it to a close. And the old past. You ought to see folks just stopping along the path and just kneeling down, praying always. Just taking some time out, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. He says, as you're walking in the old paths, stop once in a while, because there's resters along the path. It's called houses of prayer. You go in there and pray. Pray to honor God. Pray for each other. Pray for our country. Pray for those who protect us. Pray for your preacher. Pray for those that's going away from you. Pray. Not my will, O Lord, but thine be done. God bless you, my prayer.